Well, great games at your table. This is Jonathan Albin. This is Nikos RPG. And this is the Nikos RPG Launchpad inaugural episode session zero. In this we're going to be going over the gameplay essentials for playing in a role play game in the Nikos uh, world setting and also in particular Nikos uh, RPG mechanism. So we're going to go over the basics of what a player would need to know on their first session. I'm doing this in, in advance of my uh, first uh, online foray in this format. We've been trying for several weeks to create the Nikos Twitch experiment, and we haven't been quite so, as successful as I would have liked. So we're going to try this a little differently. I have a set audience that's already set to be part of the show tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., and so I wanted to make a video for them should they get in a little bit earlier or even tonight want to take a look at what you're going to need to know to play in a Nikos RPG game. Now we are going to be running uh, with live personnel and uh, audio and all of that ostensibly. We may not get off the uh, get it off the ground tomorrow, but at least we will be having our pre-game session. That is to say our session zero. And I wanted to make sure I gave you guys the information right here in one lump sum so that in future releases or future events of this nature, we'll be able to ramp up pretty quickly because we'll be utilizing the same information session after session and system after system as we go through these. Now, the uh, first thing we want to talk about are the communication protocols. One of the most challenging things to work with in today's marketplace is the ability to have players speak one at a time. In many situations, players talk over each other and they try to shout each other out. And it's not even necessarily that in today's uh, interconnected world, the system, the audio systems tend to allow multiple speakers at the same time to run over each other. And so I've established kind of a way of handling that. And the first of that is a common understanding or decorum that you should wait until uh, you're called on to speak or you're given the floor, so to speak, and then you can uh, carry on and say whatever you need to say for as long as it takes. And then once you've finished your bit, uh, then theoretically it'll go back and forth between the game master and the players with the, player, with the game master calling out uh, which players should be responding to the, to the questions or the queries or the information. Uh, but there will be those times when people do talk over each other. So one of the things we're going to be instituting is what I call, uh, for lack of a better term, the hold on rule. And that is if uh, more than one person is speaking at the same time and I notice it and, I'm, and I draw attention to it, I will do so by uh, calling out hold on over and over again until it stops. I, now, I'm not going to be rude about it and it's not really that big of a deal, but when people do talk over each other, I will just say, hold on, and then I will uh, provide direction on who should be speaking and go from there. The idea of uh, initiative within a game turn isn't going to be as much of a problem as it might be in other role-play games because we're going to do these set these scenes in terms of where the action ends and then reverse it and go sort of back through the line, adjusting as players move their positioning and their location within the scene, working from the instantaneous starting point, wherever that happens to be, whether it be at the point of engagement or perhaps with the, uh, the back range folks doing their action first. But as we move through, that order will stay the same, but we will adjust it uh, in terms of the dynamics of what literally is happening next. And while that sometimes is, or might seem arbitrary, I believe we'll be able to maintain a, uh, a fair and equitable way to break up time that way. Uh, other things about communication protocol, this will be on, uh, on air, and everyone that is aware of playing will be playing knowing that their uh, statements and, and comments um, have to be appropriately Team so that we're not uh, breaking the story or uh, using language that's too coarse for broadcast, that kind of thing. Uh, many of the 
persons that will be in the game tomorrow have been on air before and are familiar with the protocols. But I will be making sure to keep an eye out on that directory myself. The, the third thing about our communication is that there won't be any um, off-color, off out of out of team conversations during the game session. My players will be, you guys, of course, will, will be able to uh, comment or carry on with, the, with me in a conversation after the actual game session is over. But during the game session, we'll try to stay focused on the session itself. The, the main reason for having any form of communication protocol is just simply so that the show makes sense and people will be able to hear what's going on and ha be able to maintain the continuity of it. Now, if at any time during a game session, you as a player or oh yeah, you as a player decide or have a problem with understanding or there's questions to be answered, asked, feel free to use a phrase like in the meta or uh, out of game or whatever to pull us away from the action long enough to handle whatever that mechanical issue is. And we'll try to endeavor to provide as much information as possible. If there is not clarity, in other words, if you don't understand what's going on or where you are in the scene, it's perfectly fine also to, uh, you know, say in, in the meta, in the, uh, just for clarification, uh, where are we in the scene? So that way we can maintain the continuity, player, players amongst each other and with the game master as well. So that way there is a uh, back and forth, but it'll also uh, provide clarity and make better my, uh, the experience of role play. Uh, if anyone has uh, an experience with theater of the mind, you'll understand that it's going to be played dynamically. We're not going to have uh, necessarily any visuals or props during the session, just our shiny faces, so to speak, and the ability for communication. Now, when we do, the theory will be that I will have, uh, my image will be in one section of the, of the page and then the rest of the, fa the faces will be distinguished from mine as being the players in the game. And in the, in the future, of course, we'll eventually have name tags and uh, trackers on the screen. But here we are at the very beginning. It'll probably just be faces and maybe names if we can get that accomplished. Now, this is all dealing with the details of being on a recording. And those of you that are in the audience, if you have anything you'd like to say, uh, feel free to leave it in the comments section. If you happen to be online with me at the time, of course, feel free to uh, jump into the chat and ask me any questions or make any commentaries. Now, the, the next thing we want to move on to is the player injunction. And this is a mechanic that I created for the purposes of keeping game continuity and avoiding some of the challenges of the three hours that it normally takes to get a session zero going. So the player injunction is this. When you are playing a character in the world of Nykos, you are not creating a persona, so to speak. You are aligning yourself to one that is already in existence. In other words, we as a uh, player community need to be able to create a persona for our understanding, you know, putting out the numbers that are required for the gameplay and such, and it feels like a creative process because you're making all the decisions before you play to kind of front load it, but the reality is, is that when the character is completed, it will actually be manifesting in the form of somebody who actually lives in the world of Nykos, and therefore players will be expected, and perhaps this is also a communication protocol, they'll be talking in the first person when they are speaking about what their character is particularly doing. This is going to be so that we as the players will be seen as being in the scene and keep us from separating from that persona during the game session, thereby keeping the session more visceral and more dynamic. The other benefit of this mechanism is that within the player injunction are a couple of uh, known realities in the world of Nykos, and that is that the populations of Nykos that have sentient beings that are eligible for player classes are all aware of the injunction. In other words, there will be uh, a certain 
uh, you can call it a glow, you can call it a marking identifier that will let the world know that a player character has joined the game and is actually in the world. And when that happens, that injunction will be identifiable pretty much by everybody, both the uh, player characters and the world at large will recognize the nature of the enjoined, which is the, I guess, the noun form, noun form of the injunction. But the enjoined will not only be able to be perceived, but they will be known among their own people as those that are elevated, that they are somehow being contacted in a kind of an otherworldly sense of being inspired, if you will, from beyond. And this is a positive, a net positive for uh, communities because they will see that they've been honored by such. And in the same fashion as the player is elevated within the community, they'll also be able to identify each other. So as a, uh, if a new player comes into the group, the, the new player will be the one who's disoriented, not understanding where he is in the world and how that works. But the players who have any experience at all will immediately recognize a person who is enjoined and therefore know that this is someone that can be uh, added to the group or engaged with in a positive way because they will also see that they are among those who are likewise inspired. And this allows us to get past a lot of the rugged parts of bringing new characters into the game, the trust issues and stuff that it seem to be uh, coincidental with role play. We're going to kind of limit that down because we're going to make it so the players will be able to see that they are among the uh, chosen ones, so to speak. Uh, another thing about the injunction is that the nature of it will be such that when a player is unable to be here, their persona, their character is still there, but he kind of knows the role that is expected of him, and these will become the uh, camp protectors, the followers and such that would keep take care of the the horses and the gear and the cargo and that kind of thing. This allows the player to remain with the group so that when they come back, they're able to get a, a briefing on what's happened thus far because they weren't here, but their persona will have um, all of their equipment still with the group and all of that. Now, this does also lend itself to something else, and that is uh, player ownership of property can be... Um, shared if the player determines which items that are on his persona that the other players can access. Now that doesn't mean they'll be able to use any of that, that, that persona's abilities or functions because they simply drop out when the, the player isn't here. But they, their gear, of course, whatever's on their possession, is still in the world, so to speak, and can be ch shared if it's so decided by the players. I got problems with my glasses lighting down my nose. I got to figure out what that's about. Something to do with them getting bent, I think. But this uh, sharing of resources, so to speak, oh, there we go. This sharing of resources will make it so that the players can get to essential equipment, even if that player isn't in the room, so to speak. Now, this is not a game mechanic, per se. It's just something that is an understood uh, tool for role play to make sure that the players feel like they're part of what's going on and they're still uh, included in the action. Now they're going to talk a little bit about game mechanics. We are using the Nikos RPG system, so if you are unfamiliar with the Nikos RPG, uh, you can check it out at nikosrpg.com. Wait and plug. And if you want to know something about the Nikos lore, you can find that out at nikos.com slash info. Uh, dash, I'm sorry, nikos.com, no, nikosrpg.info, that's what I meant to say. So the .info is for the lore, and the .com is uh, information on the game mechanic itself. It does have an opportunity for you there to download the uh, uh, PDF of the rulebook uh, for a fee and all of that. So there's also free character sheets and... Uh, quick play guides, new things like that that'll give you some understanding of how the mechanics work. But we use a dice ramp system to uh, build up the persona numbers. Generally speaking, the ramp is only used a couple of times otherwise in the game, but 
that's essential to building a character. And so in our session zero tomorrow morning, we will more than likely be going over that somewhat in greater depth. But the ramp will be used, and then we also will talk about uh, other issues that will be coming up later in this presentation, so I'm not going to go into all of that now. Just realize that the game mechanics are all based on percentile dice, and uh, the saving throws, that what's called the base of the persona, remain the same throughout the game. They don't advance or improve, as uh, they are supposed to be representative of the core of the personality that a player is engaged with. So we'll go more into particular game mechanics in our session tomorrow, but these are kind of the essentials, the clarifications. Now, one of the rules of dice etiquette in the Nikos RPG is that die rolls are only when called for. There is no intrinsic rule that a die roll ever needs to be made. If the players say they want to do an action and the game master confer, uh, agrees with it, there's no need to actually roll dice. The, therefore, it is expected that the players won't just be arbitrarily rolling dice in advance of the confirmation by the storyteller because you don't need the extra extraneous die rolling going on. I do have set up where we're going to be playing will be in the Discord channel. And I do have at least one die rolling mechanism already in place in there. And I will be more than likely looking at a few others as we go. So this is kind of a learning experience as well. But I do have uh, at least one mechanism already in place. And when we get ready to go, the players will, will all be appraised of how to, to accomplish that. And we may even find a way to uh, show those numbers on the screen. We'll move that as we go. So just know that as a player, you're not going to want to be, you don't need to roll dice unless the, unless we agree that die roll is required. And therefore, I would ask that you don't um, incessantly sit and roll dice just to have the die rolls you know, front loaded. That's really, it's kind of silly. Alrighty, so now we're going to talk about uh, the actual persona that we're going to talk about tracking stuff. Things like munitions and, and other uh, items that are disposable won't have a quality role that required for them. They just simply are. So you have X number of arrows or X number of bolts for your crossbow or whatever, uh, throwing knives, whatever the item is, you'll have to be responsible to the players to track that. But I will, of course, be also tracking, uh, keeping notes as well to kind of uh, at once keep the players honest and also provide them with uh, feedback on how close they are getting on their ammo uh, remaining and things like that. And it's not just ammunition. It's, you know, if you're using rope and you cut a, feet, cut a few feet off of it, we'll be tracking, you know, how much rope is left. It's not really that important, but the main thing is to realize that stuff, generally speaking, if it's utilitarian, if it's useful or in particular, those things that are essential will have a quality rating to determine how how resilient or how good the good shape the material is in, and use will wear things out over time. So that's just the way that goes. Now, when we're talking about Nikos RPG, we're looking at a system that is uh, role play intensive, and we tend to downplay, if you will, the uh, crunchy part of role play games we want to make it feel as much like uh the action adventure show that we already have playing in our heads we want to try to stick to that as much as possible so there will be a definite emphasis on role playing situations over just rolling dice so it's r-o-l-e playing instead of r-o-l-l playing and i know that for some of this is a, a sticking point but it will you, you as you will see it makes for the gameplay to feel more cinematic if you will if the actions are taken in terms of uh, the role play of it not just the uh, dice rolling so let's talk a minute about the forms of conflict in nikos rpg there are basically four ways for dice rolls to be required and these are helping us to resolve conflict now that I've already created several videos about the 
quantum die rolling mechanism. And there's a video right here, put a little flag on here, so you can find the die rolling information on how you, your die roll is compared with your uh, targeted number. And so we will be using a two-way mechanism. So every action that is uncontested, so things like skills checks <coughs> that don't have a competitive aspect or don't have a counteraction, will be a, a single die roll. Success, failure, partial success, uh, wild success, all of that will play into it. And again, you can see that on the video about die rolling. But that's for checks. And if a check is made in a situation of duress or specifically difficult conditions, then the uh, system will use the persona's core values instead of their base values for the saving throws. And with the skills, it'll just be a straight uh, success fail with the modifiers of partial wild success inclusive. Uh, if it is a, contest, a contest, so in other words, two people are competing to see who gets something done first, we will do the same thing, but it will be each person will roll against their particular skill, and their relative positioning will show where they are. And the, there won't be a winner, per se, until there is a clear winner and a clear loser, just to make things easy for mechanics. So, a say, a race across a distance will be modified by how many successes you have to have accomplished and a wild success counts as two successes a perfect counts as three and uh, likewise a partial counts as a zero but it does count as one die roll for whatever the uh, objective is so if it's a a race for say an arbitrary distance of five die rolls, then it will count as one. And then you'll get one for, for uh, any success and then one extra for each tier of success. So a partial success will just get the one. A regular success would get two. A wild success would get a total of three. And then finally a perfect roll would be, would gain four brackets, so to speak. And it isn't necessarily a blocked out threshold unless that's the specific contest but it may just literally be you know until one wins and the other one loses uh, the the next kind of conflict resolution in the game are are conflicts and a conflict in and while martial combat is considered a conflict conflict is a little bit different in that a conflicted role is where one person is using one skill and the other player or other players are using other skills and so it's a relative success fail with the overall uh, success successful uh, uh, player being the one who makes the success while the opponent fails and this will allow us to watch the dynamics and each action phase will take away fatigue and we'll deal with that in a bit but the idea here is that the die rolling will be you'll be rolling you're always going to be rolling against your skill and checking your relative success fail against your opponent's roll against their skill. And so with a a contest, this would be like, for example, a one player running and the other player, uh, one player trying to run away and the second player trying to catch them. And so therefore, the, the two rules, although there's some of them both running, it literally is how quickly can I get away and the other person says how quickly I can catch you. And this would apply to hiding checks or, um, you know, finding something in a book or whatever. These are all non-combat conflicts. And then finally, combat. And combat is contested on each die roll. So when the player's action occurs, there will be rules for any uh, appropriate defender. And... Likewise, on each attacker's roll, there will be a defense roll by the player. And so, therefore, you might be rolling four or five times during a round for your defense if you are, for example, being uh, 
assailed by a, by a group of monsters or whatever. And uh, we'll go more into that when we actually play tomorrow in the uh, session zero when we, when we go through the mechanism. But I just wanted to give you the idea that you have four. You have the skills check, then you've got a contest, you've got a conflict, and you've got the combat. So these are also covered in a video, and so I'm going to put those up here at number two. There, there we go. And so therefore, we'll I'll be linking that video in so you can take a quick look at that if you're, you need to be a, get a refresher course on that. Alrighty. The next part of it is collective decision making. And one of the dynamics of the Nyquist RPG system is that the players collectively decide on their action before there are any die rolls made. So if one person is attacking and two people are protecting that attacker, or if there's a, uh, a Magi who's going to do a, you know, create a magical effect and the other players are running interference or whatever, we will have those played out but we will choose them collectively. So everyone will kind of know what everybody's doing for that set period of time. We'll resolve them all in sequence. And then once we're done, we will assess the relative success failure of the situation. And as time goes by, there will be scenes where progression through to a certain number of turns will cause a change in the condition of the scene and I'm using the, the idea here of those being the breaks in the action. These breaking points in the action will be used for reassessing. And there will be a restatement of the game state, you know, where we are, who's where, what's going on. And then the players will again call out their collective actions. And then once everyone's done that, then we'll go through the mechanical portion of it. And then we will go back to collective decision making. We'll go back and forth like that. Now, before I go much further, I know we need to talk a little, a little bit about the world of Nikos. So some some pure play mechanics stuff about the world of Nikos. Gravity is is fundamentally equivalent to Earth normal. So when I speak of hurling distance, I'm talking about how far you could throw an item in a you know, modern era. And the uh, for your ranged attacks are going to be you know considerably longer range than your hurled attacks, and your hurled attacks will be further away than your melee attacks. And we're going to try to utilize that in such a way that it it also will will fit into a movement system that matches what is Earth normal. So if you take off sprinting, I have a general idea of how far you'll go in that period of time. And we would just go back and forth throughout it. Other things that are normal, if you will, is that, yes, there are the same breaks in time uh, without commentary on how that is, that's come to be. But there is a difference in daytime activities and nighttime. Daytime does operate by the hour and such, but you can work a day well into the dark, so to speak, if you so desire. But then whatever is left of the night will be broken into three periods or three watches, early, mid, and late. And you may have you know, literally chosen to march until uh, the mid-watch period, in which case then they would only leave one more watch till dawn and therefore may not allow people to have fully recovered from the fatigue they might have lost in before that. But it's generally going to be that you have a roughly eight to 10 hour day, and then you have a three watch night. We're not going to worry about the micromanagement of the hours in the evening, so to speak. Just easier mechanically, and also more period as we haven't yet devised a uh, consistent and stable access to timepieces. Uh, let's see what else do I need to include in the world of Nikos. Um, cosmetically, there are changes. The sky isn't the same color, and the plant life, therefore, is of a different shade. And we'll go more into that as we do the actual story portion of the, the uh, session zero tomorrow. As we go into this last part, we're talking about the sessions. I do want to 
Uh, thank you for spending your time with us tonight. If you liked what you've seen, make sure you click the follow button so you'll be able to be updated whenever we're doing new videos on Twitch. And also, if you can, go over to the YouTube channel and uh, subscribe because that's a great way to get to know when we're doing anything on the live stream and uh, recorded video categories. So, in particular, the session start specifics is we are starting in the East Coast area of the world of Nikos, in particular the East Coast of the continent known as Yarlam. It's going to be, uh, as is appropriate with the clock, early winter. Uh, the climate is, uh, I would, I guess you'd call it northern latitudes and uh it's not it's not uh, above tundra so it's temperate that's what i was looking for so it's a temperate zone so there's going to be a sufficient amount of light going to be enough uh resources and such so that it'll be comfortable during the day and a little chilly at night the resources that a player begins with will be arranged in advance so that you'll be able to have a competent amount of what you need to function and the the final piece is that the persona will have had time to get to integrate with the others in the players so that the group will actually start as a unit we don't won't be doing a session zero where we crash our heads together to become a group that's I have found that to be rather unproductive and also tends to leave something in the lurch. And I want to make sure that we're as exhaustive as we can be in making each other familiar with the characters that are being played in the game. So with all of that, if there's anything you would like to talk about, I'm going to be on the air for another, um, like another four or five minutes. In the meantime, I want to thank you again. This has been the Nikos RPG Session Zero key gameplay essentials briefing and it will be available on youtube and i'm also going to be downloading it and putting it uh both on the discord and into the nikos um info site nikos doc nikos rpg dot info so it'll be part of the lore mechanism and so if you have any other questions feel free to ask them I want to thank you for being here. This has been Jonathan Albin, Nikos RPG, Session Zero, Gameplay Essentials. Alrighty, so if you're on the air and want to, if you're in the, in the chat, if you're viewing this and you want to leave a comment or add a chat, feel free to do so. I will be here for another three or four minutes. I just wanted to make sure we get the presentation portion done. And now that I've accomplished that, I'm more than willing to talk about anything. I will be closing out the uh, checkpoints on this conversation because we won't need them any longer. All righty. So if you're online and you uh, want to uh, converse, Feel free to do so. I will be going over and putting myself in the online chat channel. Should you want to jump in and have a conversation with me, you will uh, be coming live if you want to do that uh, and therefore do use the protocols that we already talked about earlier. And we'll do what we can to answer any questions you might have verbally. If you are not yet assigned to our Discord, the link is down below, and I'll be willing to communicate with you at any time. So I will, of course, have to provide you with roles, and it'll, of course, be coordinated by whether or not I am aware of who you are and whether or not we've uh, spoken before I, I give you the permissions to communicate with us. But in the meantime, thank you again, and it does look like I will probably be uh, heading out of here in a few seconds. If there's anything else you'd like to talk about, feel free to let me know. Uh, if not, of course, you can reach out to me via uh, direct messaging or here on the video when I'm here on chats. 
we do a recording every night at 11 p.m. Pacific. And so I'll be glad to speak with you any day of the week you would like. Otherwise, I'm going to head out and thank you again for being here. Uh, it's been really great talking to you all, and I'll see you next time.